What's up, guys, and welcome back to Paint Bravely, the podcast where you can find a little bit of encouragement, discover new ways to make your hobby more fun, and most importantly, learn to paint bravely. Now, today we do have some fun things. I think we have a good main topic. I think it's solid. I mean, I'm anticipating it's, it's going to be good. Uh, but we do need to throw this out there. We are kind of in a rush because Dune is out on HBO Max and we want to go watch that. So we're going to hop to it right quick, see what's going on. Brent, what have you been up to in the ne- in the last couple weeks? Well, I subscribed to HBO Max because I needed mm. to get caught up on Babylon 5. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've had had 25 years to do this and I've been procrastinating, mm. but the time has finally come because... They're giving Michael J. Straczynski an extra chance to try to get it right this time. It's coming back around. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I forgot about that. That's why. Yeah, we were talking about that. That makes sense. Uh, reboot or sequel? I think reboot. I think reboot. By the same people, though? Yeah, the same main main guy, the same showrunner, okay. writer. Yeah. Well, that's good. There was, that's there cool. was one guy who, like drafted all five seasons and wrote like 90 percent of the episodes oh, which wow. no show has basically no nobody yeah. does that that's too much work yeah and so <laughs> back in the 90s it was a show that had like a five season long arc apparently or four seasons because some got rushed and they, whatever but it was like it had an actual arc instead of just new planet every episode which was right. uh, apparently kind of cool. It also yeah. had a very bad CGI. Very, very <laughs> bad CGI. At the time, groundbreaking for TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that came and, out like uh, Toy Story era, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was early CGI. It was... Yeah. <laughs> uh, and with any, you know, uh, sci-fi or fantasy show or movie or whatever, I'm always looking for, for inspiration of, okay, do I want to get like a model of anything in here? Sure. And <clears throat> not a ton, honestly, not a ton, partially because <laughs> of that really bad CGI. And, That's funny. Uh, a couple of the alien ra- races look pretty cool, but some of them look really dumb. So yeah, <laughs> there's that. I too. mean, that's the thing, right? With like ship designs and... I know, like, a lot of people liked that show, and then a lot of people didn't, and it was because of weird stuff like that. It's like, this this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, come on. Give me my, my Star Trek with just flying saucers with stick engines out the back. Like, that makes perfect sense, right? We're used to that. <laughs> yeah, man, I was digging back into the, the history and all the old forms, and, and people used to get really angry about Deep Space Nine, like, ripping off Battlestar Galactica, because apparently they came out <laughs> at, like, the same time and had some similar themes running through them. But they, look, yeah, this, is, okay. this is all in the past, and this is, this is not directly related to paint minis. I'm Although I have been painting some minis can... while watching Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's uh, a good way to, to relate it back to. It's like, what do you do while you paint your minis that's like makes you the most productive right and this just this isn't the main topic or anything i'm just throwing this out there because we're kind of hitting on that like uh i also wanted to talk a little bit about an audiobook that i've been listening to that's my thing that i like to do when i'm painting so like is that what you do you just like throw on a, a babylon 5 or the office and you just get to it yeah i'm actually more more audiobooks myself but mm. hey neither of us being are being sponsored by audible right here so we don't need to talk about that oh well fine <laughs> yeah, they amazon wants their ad spot on paint bravely the podcast they gotta pay you know you know i could probably arrange that it's really the thing you do just talk to somebody and then they go oh sure mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of how it goes <laughs> like um yeah now we do have a a main topic today we we uh kind of hashed this out ahead of time we wrote down Mm -hmm. an idea for a main topic so a little bit later in this episode we're going to be talking about why it's sometimes okay or even good to just paint the box art just reproduce that old box art so we're going to get there but first (laughs) we got our updates we got we got stuff to talk about we've got you know what's been going on the past couple of weeks that that gives us an idea of some some wisdom or news to pass on and i've i've got more news than wisdom but casey right. <laughs> you have wisdom for us today do i so. do i are you sure 
I'll, like, I'll are you sure? You, you can you can choose uh, anything you did in the past mm, couple of weeks that might wisdom. seem wise to somebody. That's a good point. Okay, okay, I got I got something then. Okay, uh, I decided um, to move to a two week schedule for uploading on YouTube, which I've been doing. Uh, I've been doing every single week since I started, and that was was that three years now that we've been doing this. Like a long time for for like YouTube and and weekly uploading, right? Like doing that pretty rigidly. Like I think I've only missed like one or two weeks um, out of the whole time, and that was like either I was like deathly ill <laughs> or I was on out of town or something, and I just couldn't. You know, there's no no choice. But uh, yeah, so I've been doing that, and and you know what? It's just not worth doing. Like putting so much effort into making a video that's like, you know, I like doing that, but um, what I was getting back out of it was not exactly good, I guess. Not to say that, like, like uh, the response wasn't good, but, like, looking at the numbers constantly, like, feeling one way or another about last week's video compared to this week's video compared to, like, something else or trying to come up with ideas constantly to like keep up with something that nobody's that nobody's in a race for except except for myself right um so i decided to take it a little bit slower slow down spend my time on projects that i actually like to do and uh you know what so far it's been like it it's been weird <laughs> like very strange cuz it feels so weird but like it's very good at the same time. So you know, slow down sometimes. You just gotta slow down. It's fine. You'll get you'll get your stuff painted. Just make sure you're having a good time doing it. Don't rush it. So that's yeah, that's the wisdom. Wrong with taking a little more time to to get stuff the way you want it. Yeah. No, I that sounds like a good schedule. I'm I'm happy for you, Casey. Well, so thank you. expect yeah. fewer videos from Casey, but perhaps better. You know, we'll see. Uh, yeah. That that part's yet to, I mean, yet to be written. <laughs> like, so far, um, I've only put out one video <laughs> since I switched. Um, the next one will go up on the 31st, I think. So, actually, there won't be a video up from me by the time this podcast goes up. So, that that's, that's what that looks like. <laughs> um, so, it'll be the week, that following week. Um, but, like, I feel like so far... It's not that I put more effort into the video, like it still looks the same, um, but I have like expanded. So I did a thing, like I painted some orcs, right? I, I rescued some orcs, stripped them down, repaired them, 3D printed new parts, really cool. And then I was like, you know, I don't need to sit here and paint all this. Like I got an extra week, like I'm going to get some of my friends to paint the rest of these models. And then I'm going to talk about like how orcs just look cool, like no matter how they're painted. And when you put them together, they look cool together. Like, regardless mm -hmm. of whatever color skin they have or, you know, if they got red adornments or blue or yellow or whatever armor, it doesn't matter. Like, they all just look cool together. And I think that holds true pretty much for every orc. It's just regardless. They just look cool together. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> Truth. Wisdom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's all... I got all the wisdom. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I don't. I don't have any more wisdom. I think. I think all the rest of the stuff is like, yay! <laughs> Look what I did or didn't do. <laughs> hit us up. Hit us up with one more. One more nugget, Casey. Mm, okay. Okay. Um. So yeah, like we said, it's not not sponsored by Audible, but I've been listening to a book called Project Hail Mary, um, which is Andy Weir. He wrote The Martian. Uh, which is another awesome book. Uh, really enjoyed the book. It was good. It went way too quick. And uh, I'm looking for recommendations for, for sci-fi. Like on that level, if anybody knows. Yeah, I don't know if on that's that wisdom level. or not. But, but it's worth reading. It's worth checking out. The Martian and uh, Project Hail Mary. Okay. Yeah, extremely well done. Really cool. Like, uh, like hard sci-fi, where it's like, it's almost like this could have happened kind of thing. Where, like, something, you know, like, in The Martian, he gets stuck on Mars, and he, like, sciences his way out of it, right? And it's, like, it feels very realistic, like, 
how that's taken in the book. It's like crunching numbers, doing math, you know, figuring things out, and it feels, you know, real. Yeah. More science than fiction, maybe? I don't know. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, I can't help you there. I've It's just been all Napoleonic naval books for me <laughs> on tape. Okay. So you went, you went backwards. I'm, I'm looking forwards. Uh-huh, <laughs> like, uh-huh. <laughs> you thought about getting any uh any any war games in like some historical naval it'll happen it'll, it'll happen. happen come on yeah. now <laughs> i pretty soon i'm just going to be painting up model third rate ship of the line you know 74 guns maybe get some maybe get some frigates in there some sixth rates fifth rates you know sounds like a good time like uh i don't know you could use you could use rules for Oh, whatever, like, is it Armada, I think? It's like a space naval game, but you could just change the the stuff out for naval ships. There's there's plenty of rule sets for, I mean, for high seas is. combat. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> like, I've never looked into it. <laughs> Look, all, all things in their time, and this time is coming. Let me just, let me just put it that way. I think that's, that's a... A difference between you and I, and not necessarily like a bad thing, but like, if I, if I'm on a thing, like if I find a thing, like I'm all over that thing until I I complete it, I follow through, you know, like, I don't know what it is, like I I, I get into certain modes, I guess, and like I I have to follow something through, so you know I'm making a, a teeny tiny Warhammer army, like pocket hammer, right? It's like I got I gotta print out full armies, I gotta paint them, I gotta do the terrain, gotta do all this, I gotta follow it all the way through to the end and be like, okay, I did it. Now what? <laughs> you know? And you're like, someday it'll come, and I, I can't handle that. Like it's no, I'm mm. like, what are the what is the best naval game, historical naval game? What are the best <laughs> but like tell me so that this can happen and I can be like, yes, I like this, or no, it's kind of dumb. Like that's that's well, yeah. Right. For me, it's the background noise while I'm working on other stuff right now, but I can feel it building. Um, mm. But no, someday we should have an episode of, uh, you know, multitasking versus hyper-focused laser hobby uh, progression. I don't know. Yeah. And I think I, mean, I, I think I, yeah. the two of us may be good examples of those two extremes. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I am always working on a ton of different things at the same time, and uh, you you get focused. That's true. Um, yeah, that would actually be kind of an interesting. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. for another time, perhaps. Yeah, we'll we'll save that one. We'll we'll scribble that like away. That, I do like it. Now, uh, let me let me give you a little update over here. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, Paint Bravely the podcast over on YouTube, you may see that I have a cardboard gingerbread house in front of me. Is that cardboard. So. It, this is cardboard. Yep. So, uh, my my update of the week is I want to talk about a couple of products that are coming to market soon that are actually like really worth talking about. So yeah. the first one I want to talk about is Frameworks from uh, WizKids. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so this is their upcoming D and D licensed polystyrene plastic kits from WizKids. Multi part kits. Like cut them, yes. cut them down with sprue cutters, put them together just like a GW kit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah, use your regular old uh, plastic cement to put them together if you want. Like comes on a sprue, you, you clip yeah. them out, you put them together like a <laughs> plastic model kit. Yeah. So uh, I got my hands <laughs> on the first example of Frameworks uh, last weekend. So WizKids was contributing to the Free RPG Day, which is or it was uh, an event run at my local game store, and I think several different companies were all contributing to this. Yeah, yeah. But from WizKids was kind of like a a mini encounter or something. I wasn't actually real clear on the whole story, but it somehow involved a cardboard cutout gingerbread house. Sure. It came with a <laughs> eight by eight tile thing really? so it's like a little mouse pad here with eight by it's it's uh it's a mouse this was, pad this was free yeah or wow. or it was given out to stores as promotional material and sure. i uh 
got He's my not. guy Brendan to, to uh, slide it to me uh, on the down low on the I proper see day. That. I could see that. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's like a uh, encounter mat or whatever, but it's only mm-hmm. eight tiles by eight tiles. So okay, it's like a tiny little encounter mat that I guess goes outside of the gingerbread house. And then the frameworks part is uh, a plastic kit for a night hag, which is a witch who lives in the gingerbread house and who has like a little gingerbread man helper. Mm. And she has a pot that she's stirring up. Yeah. (laughs) So this was this witch, this night hag was my first introduction to the frameworks line. And uh, yeah, plastic kit and the witch, you know, the, her legs and body, and in this case, her head, are all locked in place. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's no wiggle room on those. But the arms had choices. So there were a couple of different hands. One's holding a heart. One's just like beckoning. One's holding an apple. Um, you can change the angles of the shoulders a little bit. Okay. So there's not there's there's a little bit of customization on this one. Um, but there were like a lot of bits. So there was a cauldron that's bubbling and tons of spell effects. Like the cauldron can be suspended on like a flame spell effect and then swirling mists. And um, all that was actually cast in clear polystyrene, which uh, is not actually very helpful. <laughs> no, no. But you know uh, what? Like, I think that's been a staple for D&D minis for a while now. Hmm. Like fire spell effects, elementals, a lot of the times are are cast in clear plastics, and then you get that kind of uh, transparent paint over the top, or use washes, and it has that certain look to it. So I think it's I think it's just more that historically that's where it's been. Um, maybe although maybe you know for a multi part kit, like eh, who cares? Like right, make it make it great plastic. We're gonna paint it. Like don't make yeah. this more difficult than it has to be. Yeah, and and it <laughs> seems like. The the gray plastic cauldron was supposed to have a clear plastic, like, bubbling liquid glued mm-hmm. inside it, and it was supposed okay. to sit on top of a clear plastic, you know, the gray cauldron was supposed to sit on the top of the clear plastic flames, yeah. and coming out of the cauldron is supposed to be clear plastic mists and vapors, <laughs> and all culminating in, like, uh, a vaporous gingerbread man kind of poking over the shoulder of the the night hag the witch sure sure so i left out a lot of the spell effects uh, i'm right <laughs> you know, we can talk about this someday too but i'm actually not big on spell effects most of the time hmm. um or i'll just maybe if i get like really into lighting effects you know if i go through one of those phases sure. or something maybe i'll be more into it but for the most part i like to to imagine the spells or you know see her beckoning and mm-hmm. not beckoning with a ton of crap sticking out of her hands, you know. But, yeah. <laughs> that's that's true. I think I'm I'm right there with you. Like unless you're doing some kind of OSL or some specific type of effect with your paint job, like where the the item or the bit is helping to sell that effect, like then there's no reason to really have those there. Um, it also I don't know. Like I feel like in a lot of cases, extra bits like. In particular, like knives and pouches that aren't pre sculpted into the model look seriously stupid, just glued on sometimes and I, so I just i don't I don't bother, yeah, sometimes they yeah. can so um, this is the first model I've gotten my hands on from the framework set. I think it's supposed to be a couple months in the future <clears throat> from the times of this recording, um sure. but they are starting to pop up on various websites like for sale pre-order sort of stuff yeah and so we're starting to see what the range is going to look like and what the prices are going to be so like a lot of the range is male human fighter and so that'll be a 15 (laughs) dollar kit comes with one model with a decent number of options yeah and so it'll be like the the chest and legs are all locked into position and nothing you can do about them but there'll be different arms with different weapons a couple of different heads and yeah a couple of different items that you can glue to their back or belt or whatever they might have a cape or something um and it seemed like there were gonna be a lot of different kits available very early 
So sure. I was scrolling down the list and, you know, male human fighter, female human fighter. But then you're getting to female dwarf barbarian. You're getting to... The super you know, specific, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. tiefling rogue. Uh, mm -hmm. And it actually seemed like there was a decent number of options in the in the initial line. And those those are like, you know, the player character. So my understanding is D&D has 12 different classes and like five different races, a couple of genders. Uh, well, and that's if you're like half something or half something else, then then what? That's a lot of models to like. Put that's going to add up. That's going to yeah. require, you know in-person shops to carry a lot of stock but i imagine the boxes are pretty small i mean they or, I, they probably so, are and so, if so you they, see those yeah. those D, D sections in most hobby shops they're already huge like the what is it the pathfinder models or maybe it is just the nulzers stuff i don't know there's a lot of it it's it's always huge huge display that's true at least, at least in my stores yeah, so as it is, you know, e either Nulzer's Magnificent Minis or WizKids Minis, like right now they're PVC models. Sometimes they're pre-primed, I don't know. But they're, you know, PVC yeah. to me is an inferior uh, plastic for, for making models out of. Squishy. And the the reason we wanted to talk about this in the first place is because I think both of us agree that polystyrene is the best material out there for models right now. I would, uh, I would say know, that, yeah. I would agree. Metal, resin, whether it's cast or whether it's 3D printed, uh, and then PVC, all inferior compared to just uh, injection molded polystyrene. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's lightweight, it's relatively durable. You, more glues work with it. It's easy to sand and file and cut and modify and doesn't break under its own weight. It doesn't bend. Yeah, it's super. I mean, it is like it, essentially when when that stuff came out and they started making kits with it, it was like revolutionary, right? And that's why Games Workshop has been on top as far as their kits go for a long time because they've been using that for a long time. And now with the way that they're 3d sculpting and cutting models up, it's even better. You know, it's like it goes hand in hand. So you get some really cool stuff out of that material. And, uh, I, I don't think we've, we probably haven't seen the end of its capabilities, but, uh, I think we're maybe getting close to the limit, but I don't think there's anything out there that's going to be better. Right. Right. So, you know, obviously Games Workshop, I mean, first off, obviously there's been, uh, you know, model cars and airplanes and, and battleships made out of polystyrene for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Games Workshop makes most of their stuff out of polystyrene, and it's good. You can make high detail models with that. Um, yeah. And there are a few other companies doing polystyrene models, so... You've got uh, Warlord and Mantic and, and Weird, uh, probably yeah. a few others. But the, the uh, reason that I think Infinity Frameworks is, is, is newsworthy is it's D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. WizKids is a big name in that space. Uh, I mean, as it is, you can go into like a lot of local stores and see racks and racks of WizKids mm -hmm. models, even like kind of crappy uh yeah. Uh, PVC models. Um, so this is going to be nice models that are customizable, available for people's player characters in D and D, made out of a good material, and are going to be widely available. So I think this is yeah, this is this is a big day, and I'm excited. Yeah, oh, I I think I'm right there with you. Um, after having seen the the lineup and some of the monsters, especially some of the larger monsters that are coming out, like. Um, they're really focusing on adding a lot of bits so that you do get a lot of variety out of one kit. Now, that also means that they are charging a fair amount for their models. Now, I think $15 for a hero character that you're going to probably be playing for a while, assuming, right, is a sweet deal, like for a good kit, you know? 
Um, yeah, if you like it. So, so like I said, yeah. the you know the chest and legs, no customization there. And if they're, <laughs> and if the line is already starting off, you know everything from male human fighter to female tiefling rogue. I mean, yeah. there's there's not exactly going to be you know male human fighter variant five. I don't think that's coming along anytime soon to get like different armor and stuff. Um, sure. So. So in some ways, you know, there, you better like the armor that's on your race and class. Yeah, or, or but else I mean, that I think kid there's still might a good not, variety. You know, um, at least in but the poses. The, but you can get you know something that represents your character, a couple of different head options, a couple of item options, a couple of weapon options, and if that at all jives with the character that you're making in your next game. Yeah, the the price for those kind of player character kits are fifteen dollars, yeah. and I think most people, I think that's going to be worth it for most people. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. I would imagine a lot of people who are strictly D and D don't necessarily do a lot of mini painting at this point, or if they do, it's like it's relatively new. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. like you know, from what we've seen in the last few years, like it's it's starting to become. A thing where like oh you know you sit down and you paint your D, &D minis and you know like there, there's always been the terrain aspect of painting that stuff up but i think having those pre-done models and now multi-part kit models for the first time like is going to open and expand this hobby into a much larger audience than we may realize i think <laughs> and that's that's one of the reasons i'm so pumped about this yeah uh yeah i mean i I got that night hike and just like that day I was building her up and taking pictures and, and started priming and painting. And I think this is, this is going to be good for the hobby. The more people who get in from whatever entry point they find, um, wonderful. Of yeah. course, you know, Warhammer and Wargaming has been a great entry point for mini painting. But if, you know, especially with the rise in D&D, &D, the more people start painting because they're having fun with D&D, &D, the better. So yeah, right on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any downsides right now that you can see? So I will say that uh, just on the one model I had, the assembly, so it's a, it's a witch and she's wearing like a, a robe or rags or whatever, kind of a mm -hmm. robe-like sort of thing. Sure. And the the way the assembly went is there was like a front half and the back half of you know her torso and legs yeah. and so anytime anytime there's a joint on a robe it's kind of a lot of times it's hard to hide where that yeah. joint is yeah. and so in this case you know there was essentially a a join line from one shoulder all the way down her side down her leg down you know back around <laughs> up the other leg up up to the other shoulder yeah. and you know being very careful with my model glue i was able to get that pretty good and then i was you know able to scrape that back down with my hobby knife pretty good yeah um and a couple of the bits are made to kind of cover that up a little bit but oh okay so we'll i considered see. it yeah yeah we'll see how the the other models go together yeah, uh, maybe that was just ones. something that was a problem with this, but it was one of those things like, oh, not not the best place of of joints. So I'll, <laughs> you know, just fair review there. But I, uh, once I got it primed, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty yeah. good. I mean, um, I will say that like most models that have robes in general yeah. have mm -hmm. some stupid line like that. Like even expensive ones. Like I I just put together that Nagash, which is what like a hundred and. $50 MSRP model and there's just the gnarliest gap down both sides of the robes <laughs> like and it's like come on guys like really it's ridiculous um I mean I had to use milliput to fill and sand that stuff down like you know spend an extra four or five hours doing that so cool yeah, yeah. so I mean it's not so, uh, it's not that that uh that's necessarily a fault I think it's a, a general thing with robes <laughs> so you're right maybe other minis might be a little different right 
I, yeah. I think that's the case. And uh, in this promo pack, there weren't instructions. I, I don't know if Brendan just really? forgot to give me like the, the <laughs> instructions. He's like, oh, uh, here's this thing that goes together to make a gingerbread house. Uh, here's like it. this tiny please. little play mat. Uh, <laughs> here, here's the sprue for the night hag. Yeah. And I don't know if there were instructions in there, but yeah, so I was... I mean, it's one model. You can pretty much tell which bit goes where. Yeah, that's true. It's usually fine. But, yeah. By the time I got to the clear plastic, like, spell effects, though, there were, uh. like, seven <laughs> pieces of clear plastic spell oh, effects no. that were all just, like, flame or mist or... I did not get the... <laughs> One of them was pretty distinct because it had a giant smiling gingerbread man on it, but uh, <laughs> there, there were right. six that pretty much blended together in my mind. Okay. And so I was just like, no, I'm not. I mean, it was supposed to be like mists of uh, of swirling, bubbling cauldron fire or something. Sure, sure. But I was just like, nope. But one, I don't want it anyway. And two, there's no way I'm going to figure out how to put all these bits <laughs> together without instructions. So Right. Well, and it's nice to have extra bits anyways. Like, if you ever want wispy uh, smoke stuff, like, that that can come in handy. Like, I can already think of a couple things that I would have probably used that for, like, even recently. Yeah, or, or a burning ginger man. Yeah, that gingerbread man. incredible, yeah. <laughs> a burning gingerbread man. Like, oh, let's paint that up. That sounds like a good time. Yeah. <laughs> So like, what story is looking that? online, the MSRP for the Night Hag kit, this this uh, witch that I have here, that's twenty five dollars. So the yeah. price for like the player characters, the the male human fighter, mm -hmm. looks like fifteen dollars. Okay. Which for a player in a game of D and D, cool. That's a that's actually I'm I'm cool with that yeah. price point. Yeah. I, I think I probably paid for that for my first like D and D model that I used in a game, like. 20 uh 20 something years ago even it was a pewter model and i think i paid that much for it at least yeah but and and so i think 15 is fine yeah but if you are like a dm or gm or whatever and you're you're trying to collect a bunch of of monsters and villains and, and minions yeah i think it's going to get expensive fast so the the, the multi-part stuff yeah yeah so the slightly, like the larger sized enemy monsters, so the witch or a troll or an ogre, those were at the $25 price point. And depending on the kids, like maybe, so like the witch is at 25 maybe, maybe. I'm glad I got it for a free promotional uh, weekend, but you know, if I needed a witch with gingerbread men, you know, if I was yeah. in the mood for that, I'd maybe Man. spend the 25 you know, that's... It's so specific. It's really for, specific. For but if I, I mean, you know, like, I'm sure you can get rid of the gingerbread man, but like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say because, like, you know, uh, a special character for uh, Age of Sigmar is like twenty five, thirty five bucks, mm -hmm. and most people are just like, whatever, that's fine. I want that guy. So, like, maybe, yeah. but then again. I don't know, like for a one shot kind of deal, like, yeah. oh, let's go to this hag house and kill this gingerbread man. Like, was that an hour, two hours, maybe <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. The, so that one seems really specific and uh, I don't know exactly whether or not they're ever going to be selling their. Uh, their cardboard gingerbread house or the the little encounter that went with that i don't, I don't know if that's ever gonna probably make its right, way like a into a, a real product or just be promotional or whatever but you know see um, that's something i might actually be into it's like hey we have this thing set up for you it's a two-hour mini game you know one shot campaign that you can run with x amount of people here's that the, would be fun the stuff uh, all the the prompts for you to go through with your party and mm -hmm. it's like, you know, yeah, it's a hundred bucks. This is a game that you can play and it can change every time. You know what I mean? Like that, that actually feels more like something that they could use that for. And they might, cause they have that other product. Oh, I bet the business minded folks over at WizKids are, they're, <laughs> they're scheming these things up. Oh, I'm sure you, they you are. Believe they, it. they scheme a lot oh, of yeah. things up, don't they? They do. Ooh. They do. Man, so I just bought a WizKids uh, now that now the troll, day. like, like a customizable troll uh out of nice plastic for 25 
a little yeah. more general and so that you might get some more attention on that same with sure. the ogre so the, the the one that seems like it might be a miss though is they have sets of five enemies so buy a set of five orcs and you can to a degree it looks like you can customize each of the five orcs you know again same legs same body but a couple of choices for for some of the the arms and knickknacks yeah so they've got like a set of orcs and a set of kobolds and the pricing for that is fifty dollars for a box and that one to me <sighs> fifty dollars for five kobolds yeah. i mean they looked like they were pretty good kobolds but uh they, they look good i don't know <laughs> I don't that's know. Tough. That's fifty that's really fifty dollars for five kobolds. That's uh, I bet they'll, they'll sell. Is, uh, they'll sell. Yeah, they maybe will. not. Maybe not a ton, but people people need those kobolds. And so I mean, many of the kobold like minis on the market right now are not good. So that's true. Um, the comparison I can think of is uh, Grotz, Warhammer Grotz. Mm -hmm. I think it's twenty dollars. For ten of those right now, might even be cheaper. And and those are all monopose though. And I mean sure. the the little image I saw as like a pre-sale on some random website made it look like each of those five kobolds had two or three different variants you could build them as that were each kind of unique and cool looking and stylized and fun. Yeah, you know so I wonder. That. Uh, but uh, if it come if they come with extra arms, extra head, extra different things, I have to imagine that uh, there will be some three D printed body leg combinations that then you could use those extra bits on. Sure. Um, in which case, fifty dollars probably more than worth it. Well. I mean, if you have a 3D printer, you can just be printing <laughs> yeah, your own kobolds. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> I guess I guess we, we know some people who have uh, pretty good 3D print kobolds out there. Yeah. That's true. You know, <laughs> his are a little bit uh, beefier and fatter and, and funnier, but uh, yeah. That's that, my kind of model. My, my kind of bold, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my kind of most models in general. <laughs> like, give me that goofy guy. Yeah, that one. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's paint that. So that is that is one thing that's coming up on the horizon. I don't know if it's late, late, late 2021 or early 2022, mm -hmm. but I'm excited about frameworks. Maybe get some more D and D people into. Like Painting. actually working with nice models and and yeah. taking taking customization and painting a little more seriously. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. If you're if you're starting off with current whiz kids with like the floppy swords and like nasty yeah. caked on pre primed, <laughs> um, I can see why the the culture of really caring about your paint jobs hasn't totally caught on in the D and D world yet. I can see that. Um, but you and start, I mean, yeah, you know. Oh, you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> like, I I knew, yeah. I knew people who used to paint. Like, they they get hero clicks, which are pre painted floppy models, and they that's where they started painting. They're like, oh yeah, I, I play tabletop games. I, you know, I paint hero clicks, and it's like I don't know how you manage, but that's cool. Like, I I played that game. I don't know how I could paint one of those. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> It's floppy, but, it's real but no, floppy. I, I, I think that has been the culture though of, uh, you know, I certainly played D and D minis, which were pre-painted polystyrene floppy minis. Mm -hmm. I had fun with that game yeah. and on the back of the, the skirmish rules, they had the rules for using those minis in you know, actual RPG version of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, it, I don't know if this is derogatory or not, but it seems to me that the tradition in the D&D &D community has cared less about cool paint jobs, and partly because you don't need minis at all to play Dungeons and Dragons and have a good That's time. That's true. It's so optional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's completely optional, but um, even even in the, the pockets that do use minis for a lot of their games, some of them 
Se- seems like there's a lot of folks there who who have a lot they could learn about painting and and working with nice sure. models and yeah. So I am I think this is going to be a great step up for the the whole mini painting community and I'm excited about it. So yeah, and speaking of like maybe a, a an entryway into painting your new multi part kits D and D models, uh, Army Painter has now come out or they are coming out with speed painting paints. Yes, they are, Casey. Yes, yes, they are, Brent. Yeah. Yes, they are. So, uh, <laughs> this is this is my other little update for for the week, and I think it does flow really nicely with what we were just talking about. So, yeah, Army Painter is putting out a line of paints called Speed Paints, and essentially they're Army Painter contrast paints. This is such a better name too. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, they jumped I mean, on that. They That's both good. work contrast they're, they're like, both no, good in their own no, way no. and you know what we're talking about here true very true still yeah so i mean this is pretty much what you'd think they'd be it mm-hmm. is uh totally not contrast paint in <laughs> army painter bottles and yeah. in theory they're going to be priced less than contrast paints and well, because they're contrast army painter bottles you're not going to knock them over and spill them all over your table yeah, yeah. Yeah, as long as they're less than $7.80 American per bottle that you're going to spill on your first day using it, uh, then, then they're a better <laughs> deal. Yeah, Yeah, I still, like, I, I understand the spilling. I think we've I've mentioned this before. Like, I still haven't actually spilled a bottle of wash or contrast, like, ever. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and it's, I've, I've seen people do it in person, too. And it's like, what, what, what? See you do it, literally, like <laughs> spilling washes. <laughs> yeah, again, Danny, we're sorry. We're sorry <laughs> about your family's kitchen table. Uh, we tried to clean Fine. it up, uh, but probably if you still look, there's like a little bit of redder wood yeah. there in the center. Uh, there's a, there's a small possibility that that I mean may we, be true. we I don't think fast. so. I, I was like, Casey, so. get them get them paper towels, Casey. <laughs> yeah. And we talked before on Paint Bravely, the podcast, that having easy access to paper towels is huge. Yeah, huge and plus. one nice the thing. Hobby, hobby space. Yeah, and that day, we were working at our level one hobby station, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. Our, you know, just temporarily set up there, Danny's kitchen table. And one nice thing about working in a kitchen is you got a yeah. rack of paper towels right there for when you spill that uh, Caraberg crimson all over somebody else's <laughs> kitchen table. Yeah. Yeah, let's see the thing about these army painter paints. What do you spill that's somebody else's caraper? <laughs> yeah, all over somebody the else's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so much yeah. worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you spilled someone else's eight dollar <laughs> bottle of wash. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> There's like a, okay. a buck fifty left in the bottle by the time Brent got done with it. <laughs> uh, okay, so. It's not just that it's that the entire top is off and it's a liquid so that when it knocks over, it all spills out. That's part of the design. The other part of the design is that the lid doesn't just come off. The lid stays on top of the bottle, sticking up. It's a lever arm. It is sticking up there um, yeah. as a trap for you to it, push it, it over. It, like, gives it momentum, like, instantly. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah that... it's, not, it's not sticking up like in the center of mass or, or, or you know no, in the no. center it is sticking up to the side so it's yeah. already weighting the bottle in that direction and just the slightest touch on that perfectly positioned lever arm just seven dollars and eighty cents gone you know yep. plus like a couple cents worth of paper towels and like your sure, sure. your entire mood for the evening yeah but, right yeah. your pride that's all Bye. The point is, though, that with the Army Painter speed paints, that's just not going to happen. Right. It's just not. It's not going to happen. At least one other company, I'm trying to remember, was it Scale 75? Yes. Uh, Instant Color Scale 75. Instant Color Scale 75. Yeah, so, you know, the heavy washes, heavy colored washes from Mm -hmm. other companies are not a new thing. 
They yeah. really weren't new when Games Workshop put them out, although Games Workshops were thicker than a lot of what else was on the market. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I think the these coming out from Army Painter is so exciting is because, uh, kind of like WizKids, Army Painter has worked its way into a lot of local shops. Yeah. So, yeah, I can go to the mall and get a starter set of Army Painter paints right now. And yep. I cannot say the same for Scale 75 or Reaper or Pro Acryl or anything else. That's a good point. I mean, it like its accessibility in general is way, way higher. Um, I think one of the stores in my area carries a handful of Scale 75 paints uh, that they don't restock pretty much ever, or if ever, to my knowledge. I don't think they've ever restocked it. Um, and they did buy like one set of the instant colors but i haven't seen any come back and it's been a year mm -hmm. so yeah it's like nobody really is looking for that stuff like the army painter rack though that they have is huge and always gets restocked like army painter just is everywhere and it's in all the stores right yeah. and <laughs> i mean we've talked about before like the actual war paints range from army painter is is not my favorite thing no but, not my favorite uh, thing. no the some mm -hmm. of their other stuff, some of their like non flagship product stuff, I actually like a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been testing out their airbrush paint, and mm -hmm. I do like that. Um, that's that's nowhere near as newsworthy though, because airbrush paint is not something that's going to be stocked at the mall. It's not uh, something that's uh, of use to everybody. Sure, uh, it's. It's way down the list of things that a beginner is ever going to be purchasing. Yeah. But the the little bottles of speed paint here, you go, you get yourself a, a WizKids Frameworks, a bottle of primer, a couple of bottles of uh, Army Painter speed paint. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that could very plausibly be somebody's first purchase who's getting into the hobby mm -hmm. at their local store next I'm, year i would say that is a good way to go yeah right yeah um so where we are right now i think army painter it, it kind of seems to be like they're just starting to get stuff coming off the assembly line uh out of their paint mixing and bottling factory or what <laughs> have you there because sure. the so far they've sent reviewers three different colors and they're not even they're not even fun colors. It's dark blue, it's dark brown, <laughs> and it's gray. Oh man! And which is enough to tell that like, okay, yeah, this is doing what a heavy wash should do. Uh, no problem dark, so though. far. Seems decent. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, but it's not. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna withhold further comment until I've tried some more colors. But okay. I, <clears throat> I, I think it's something that's pretty hard to mess up. Uh, the the marketing materials claim that the relative pigmentation between the different colors is going to be similar. So like mm -hmm. for, for contrast paints, it, it was kind of widely known that, okay, some of these one coat and you've got a really, really dark teal or you've yeah. got a really <laughs> dark turquoise or blue or whatever. But you you put on the the guillemot flesh and it's like okay you've got a slight stain of tan <laughs> you know uh, which is it, it's funny because uh, that, that guillemot flesh <laughs> as you put it uh, that's my favorite um, looks just like friggin' Reichland flesh shade like there's no difference <laughs> like it's the same stuff <laughs> so I think the medium's a little different that's about it yeah but you're right yeah that that was a a pretty big thing. It's like the discrepancy between pigmentation was so huge and it's like, oh, okay, you have to like memorize what each paint does, which is right. stupid. <laughs> it's way more difficult. To so, I mean, I mean to be fair, that is partially just the way pigments are. Sure. Like in any paint range, your yellows are going to act different than your blues. Mm -hmm. And part of learning to paint is just learning the, little idiosyncrasies idiosyncrasies of each mm -hmm. color of of paint yeah. um and those will vary a bit between brands but 
in theory, according to their marketing materials, Army Painter has tried to even that out a little bit in their speed paint range. And uh, we'll see. I can tell you that the gray, the dark blue, and the uh, what dark brown were all pretty, pretty similar. Dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I think, I think the thing is, uh, because, yeah, you're right, there, there are differences between paints in in a range right and you have to get used to certain things about certain colors and pigments and whatever like white is always tricky right um that kind of thing but in the contrast range it was like yeah this turquoise is like dark but this yellow is really bright whereas if you water this turquoise down a little bit it's really bright it's just a lot it's it's a much wider variety or like there's 10 different browns and if you don't water them down they all look the same that's sure. a lot to like then deal with after the fact i don't know they don't because they don't act differently they're just right like the level of pigmentation is different it yeah. feels like that so I am curious to to get my hands on the rest of the colors from this Army Painter line to see, I mean, partially just to see what the pretty colors look like, um, yeah. <laughs> but also to see if, you know, test some more of them out to see if any of them do act different and if any of them are bad, <laughs> you know. Sure, um, uh, it's but, inevitable. And, and also just to, <laughs> yeah, test that, that relative pigmentation. Um, but yeah, in, in conclusion, this is... Totally not contrast, which is a fun way to paint, whether whether it's the best way for a beginner to learn to paint or not, uh, I don't know, but it is fun. Uh, and there it's are fun. some models yeah. where it looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And if, if that's the style of painting you like, uh, right on. Um, yeah. And I think it's going to be widely available. I think it's going to be reasonably priced. And mm-hmm. I think it will be the case that some of these Army Painter speed paints will be in the very first, you know, shopping basket that a new painter buys. Um, yeah. And so for some people, this is going to be their first experience of, of painting minis. And that makes it an important launch. I mean, new products and new paint lines are coming out all the time. Mm-hmm. And... I mean, I, I think we both like Pro Acryl, you know, I, I think a lot of our friends like Pro Acryl. Yeah. Uh, but right now you can't buy that at the mall. So no. yeah. it is it is less important to the overall painting community That's true. <laughs> than, than the stuff that you can buy at the mall. So That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's and that's I think that, you know, when I started, it was like, well, yeah, here's a huge rack of citadel paints and that was like the thing you used to paint your citadel models right you know and that was that was it made sense um and now that there's just so many out there like whatever's at the store is probably the thing i'm gonna end up buying the most and like luckily for me at least like i have a good variety in types of hobby shops and the types of paints they they carry you know so I, I do have pretty good access in my area, um, but I would say that most areas, even if you don't have good access, they're at least going to have this Army Painter stuff. So it's it's right. good to, to go for what, what you have available to you and get used to that. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah, in, in some ways, Army Painter is sort of like the off-brand to Games Workshop. And so it's... It, it's uh, always felt like that to me. Like they're... Yeah. They're the the diet coke, right? They're the the off, not quite, or the, no, uh, the doctor the doctor thunder doctor thunder the, the doctor yeah. perky. There you go. <laughs> Wait, is Doctor Pib the same thing? No, or, it doesn't matter. Does, Mister Pib is important. like the the Mr. knockoff Pibb. brand, Mr. but it's Pibb. still like a good brand. Like I like Mister Pib. That's like that's a good like uh, cherry cough syrup soda. You know what I'm saying? That's that's All a right. good one. Um, but yeah, the, your Dr. Thunders or your Mrs. Plebs or whatever, that's when you start getting, you know, way off brand. Shasta. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shasta Cola. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I also really like Vallejo, like just yeah. flat out my favorite 
line of paints has been Vallejo for a while. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm sure that that'll come and go over the years, but that is, that is a solid go-to brand. Uh, but or at least near me, it's, it's hard to get like, yeah. it, it's pretty much a, you have to order it for, for where I live, where yeah. I live, no local stores are selling Vallejo. Um, and it seems like, you know, Games Workshop, Army Painter are more locally available. And in terms of big product releases that we should all be aware of, yeah, good to keep an eye on what Army Painter is doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because I think that they're one of those companies that they come out with so much stuff. And like we've talked about in the past, it's kind of hit and miss. Um, but, you know, I think mm-hmm. they're, they, they probably have more hits than misses. Um, like a lot of their paints, I'm just not a fan of, but, uh, some of them work really well. Some of them are just good color. So it's, it's a weird thing uh, because it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in some ways it doesn't even matter if they're any good or not. They are, (laughs) they are in so many different multi-packs and under so many like slightly different branding and, and, uh, they're they're everywhere and so they are culturally important to us whether sure. they're any good or not and, and yeah, like you said some of them some maybe. of them are good too so yeah yeah yeah, yeah that uh what is it brain brain matter beige or something that's, that's a good one good color <laughs> anyways <Yes. laughs> like the one that i actually i can't re- actually i can't used. remember if i actually like that one or not but are you, are you recommending that i give that another shot the brain matter beige I, I want to say that one I've had some success with uh, for doing okay. like undead skin tones and stuff. Uh, my, my go-to right now that I've been really enjoying that I feel like is, is uh, I don't know, like the paints just work for me a little bit more how I want them to is, is using Pro Acryl and, uh, and Scale 75 in conjunction. Like a lot of base mm-hmm. coating with the Pro Acryl, a little bit of highlighting, and then a lot of the blending and glazing with the Scale 75 has worked really well for me. So. Uh, both paint ranges not available locally pretty much at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Unfortunately. I've seen neither of those at my local mall. Yeah, yeah right. No, it's it's definitely right. not something you're going to find. <laughs> it sucks, but whatever. What are you going to do? All right. So that was, that was my update. Two interesting product lines, which I think are important because they are going to be part of many new painters uh, uh set up so i think you're right yeah. and I, I am excited yep. for the the contrast or the speed painting paint, whatever um i mean i like to airbrush contrast paints i use contrast paints quite a bit so you know if that acts similarly through my airbrush then hey you know what that's an entire range of airbrush paints that i'm going to be more than happy to pick up so we'll see how it goes right on yeah. All right. You got uh, you got anything else you want to tell us about, or or should we get into our I our think, event? I think we should get into our uh, our main topic at this point. I mean, I always have things to talk about, but uh, whatever. Oh, our, <laughs> our friend Neil at Real Terrain Hobbies launched a Kickstarter of yeah. um. You have written here Hobbit Hole. That's actually incorrect. They yeah, are I, Halfling that's, Homes. That's our notes. I was gonna say Halfling Homes. Thank you. So yeah. Uh, they, I mean, Bleak I guess they remind maybe? me a little bit of Hobbit holes, and you they, have the you have the option of a rectangular door on the front or a circular uh, door. Circular um, door. Yeah. So In, so Neil uh, did map. the uh, did all the three D sculpting on these, and they are, I mean, house fronts, I guess, that you like yeah. put into your terrain projects. And Neil has, I think, a three part video series of building the Shire. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in his it's shire, epic. it's halflings who live in halfling homes. Exactly. Um, it, it is quite uh, epic, though. It is like, it that was an a... amazing build. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, but if you have a 3D printer and you want halfling homes, uh, go take a look on Kickstarter. Uh, there we helped Neil out. It's doing fine already, though. But It is. It's uh, killing it. Yeah. Killing it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. You, you yeah, man, that's Neil. on the list. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are beautiful. Uh okay, so we crossed that out. All right, right. You wanna? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're don't, ready, we don't can have do any the main more topic. Uh, sponsored sections for this week. Uh, none of that. 
uh yeah okay well let's get into our our main topic so uh like we we kind of hinted at earlier we wanted to talk about why you should paint like the box art so uh any kind of model that you buy is usually going to have some nice looking pre-painted model on the front you're going to go wow i really like that and uh you know it's going to compel you to pick up a model a lot of the times it's that's why i buy models like i, I bought specifically the iron jaws for warhammer uh, because of the sweet yellow armor like i wanted that yellow armor so you know when i did that it was like oh everybody's saying oh yellow is so hard to paint and it's like you know what like i want this yellow armor off the box art so what did i do i i tried my hardest to get that look um and i used techniques that i found online to do that and there was a lot of information because that's the box arts that's what people were teaching uh so we want to kind of go into some of that of like why it might be just a good idea to start there um or you know even if you've been painting for a while like why to go for the box art in some cases um if it's not games workshop there are like world class painters painting the box art for some of these models out there and it's like you know i should probably try that <laughs> yeah there's a topic yeah for sure so uh i'll start off here i often try to avoid the box art to get a different color combo to get something that's mine to get something new to to add something new and beautiful and wonderful to the world, a product entirely <laughs> of my creativity, um, because choosing the colors is a lot of the choices that you make when you're painting a model. True. But it can feel like an amazing luxury to remove all of that decision-making process, all of that, in some ways, stress, mm -hmm. and just say, these are the colors I'm going to use. Not going to mess yeah. around with trying to see, you know, what goes with this color or what I want the main couple of colors to be, or is this going to clash, or or should this be warm or cool or you know whatever. Yeah, all the just, all the just, hot keywords you hear floating around of how you should paint your models, right? Yeah, we we doing non-metallic metal, we doing edge highlighting, we doing sweet blends. We I don't know, yeah. or just just paint it like it's on the box. Uh, it, yeah. Take out, take out all of those decisions, and there are still interesting decisions to be made while you're painting. But it's an entirely different subset, and and I think that it changes the focus of what you're doing and what you're thinking about as you're working on that model. Yeah. Um, I think that that a lot of it too is, uh, you know, because even on the back of most model boxes they you know they kind of give you an idea of some of the colors that were used but it's not the whole story right so there's some reverse engineering and figuring out like well why do these colors go together why were they put together if they were put together on the back of the box you know you kind of get a feel for how things just work together like i said so you know if you're painting a bunch of greens and it's like oh well, you know you, you got to start with this purple and then you paint a green and then you paint this like light green. You're just like, I don't understand. You know, well, it might not be something that you've ever actually tried before. And, you know, you see the result on the box. So it's kind of like proof of concept. So sure, you try something new. Well, and yes, if, if the box does inspire you to work with colors that you've never used before, hey, that's a good prompt to, to push you into to trying something new. And so there is, there is, on one side, the box art can be, here, try this new thing, here's a prompt for you, this is going to be a useful exercise. But on the other side, it can also be, here's something that you're partially familiar with already, here are, here are the colors we used, allegedly, <laughs> and <laughs> Most here are the techniques we used, allegedly. Uh, and um yeah and and so it can be either learning something new by by trying to reverse engineer it or mm -hmm. learning something new because yeah you, yeah you you really haven't tried any of that stuff before that's true and on the other hand it's it's uh it's something that you're probably going to find a tutorial for and you have the 
literal perfect reference for. So you can probably get pretty close, you know, and, and learn some stuff along the way of, you know, maybe more advanced techniques rather than, you know, just layering than highlighting and calling it a day. You know, you're going to probably have to take a few more steps if you, if you start to watch tutorials that show you how to paint this specific model in the way that they painted it on the box. Um, yeah. So having access to education like that, that is very specific, is kind of a luxury. Like, you know, beyond uh, historically, most of us have not really had that. Um, it is very specific, like to be like, I like the yellow on these iron jaws and to find like 50 videos on how to paint the yellow on these iron jaws. It's like, that's a lot of information to take in that is probably going to get you there, you know? Uh, that is a very good point. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of us, when we're watching painting videos, we, you know, maybe we're filing away a few clever ideas or, or thinking of ways that we can adapt something that we're seeing in this, you know, random painting video to something that we might do later. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it may be pretty rare uh, except for maybe ultramarines or something, but it may be pretty sure. rare that people say, I'm going to take this model and I am going to do exactly what this person, you know, leading the tutorial is doing. I'm going mm -hmm. to reproduce exactly what is in this video. Right. I think the most people watching that video do not do that. No, probably not. And... And I think there's absolutely value to, like you said, like there is, there is somebody in a lot of these cases telling you exactly what to do to get that box art. Not, not every piece of box art has a cool tutorial, but a lot of them do. So if, if, a lot of if we're in that zone, <laughs> a yeah. lot of them do. Depends, depends what company you're getting your models from and all that. But uh, a, a, a lot of times, a lot of times. Yeah. And so that is not only kind of a different way to paint your models, but a different way to consume hobby videos of mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to watch this video in some ways for the actual complete purpose in which it was intended. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Go figure. Is that why it was made? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times <laughs> I watch a video and I'm like, huh, you know, that dry brushing kind of looked good. Maybe maybe uh, maybe I should give dry brushing another thought instead of being like, ah, oh, this yeah. is how I'm layering up this exact type of green on these orcs, right, right, right. Okay. right. Yeah, I mean, because we I think we do get caught up in that with with watching the videos. It's like we try and take little bits here and there, but it's like I think uh, more often than not, you probably are missing something. There's a, there's a slight disconnect unless you're following it to paint something within that. Cause like, why am I relaying this information if it's not for someone to copy it? Right. It's like, cool. That's how I got here. But like, not, uh, yeah, I don't know. Not that, like I said, well, I, anybody's going to actually follow that, but yeah. I mean, I assume most people watching my videos are not doing exactly what I'm doing. I hope they're not like going no, out I mean... and finding that model and doing exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. But I do hope, like, like I try to put little tidbits in there of like I tried this technique out and this was actually kind of cool. I tried this yeah, tool yeah. out or this brush or this paint and this this kind of worked neat. So when I'm making my videos, I actually am intending for people to get weird little tidbits or, or little ideas and and to adapt that to whatever they work on next. Um, yeah. But some of these tutorials are very step by step yeah. and could be followed as an instruction manual to try to replicate that box art and to learn something new and different by following that process. Mm -hmm. Well, like I think when I'm, when I'm watching a painting video and I don't know if this happens to you, I've, I've heard this happens to other people, but you, you know, you start watching it and like, okay, you lay down that color. Cool. All right. And then they go, yeah, now I'm going to use this color. And you're like, okay, well, that seems a little strange. I don't, I don't know if that's going to work. And this is like, mm -hmm. you know, in your head, you're thinking like, no, no, that's not going to. They get like three or four more steps. And you're like, no, this isn't working. 
And then step 15, you're like, oh, no, that works really well. Like, wow. You know? Um, there's a weird thing that happens that, that, that uh, I don't know, whenever I watch videos, I'm, I'm like super skeptical right up until the end. And then I gotta like go back and be like, no, okay, what did they actually do? Because I, I didn't think any of that was going to work at all. <laughs> and, I mean, sometimes, like, I think a lot of times what I take away from a video is some color recipe. Mm -hmm. Yellow over pink primer, for example. You know, you, yes. you take away some little thing like, oh, this is an interesting way to, to paint yellow or uh, to paint blue or to paint green skin or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the actual, the actual act of going in and following all of that recipe on the intended model I think there's there can be a lot of power in that because I think you may pick mm -hmm. up on some of the subtleties exactly of yeah. of why those choices were made on that model. You might pick up on like, oh, I see why it was ordered this way because mm -hmm. I don't know these shields get in the way otherwise, or right. yeah, you you can't dry brush later in the the process because it's <laughs> exactly. totally going to ruin gonna this or you know whatever. Well, and that's, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's like, I, you know, when I watch the videos, I, I'm skeptical. I'm not sure. But, you know, you follow that process through. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, that I, I understand after putting it to, to use, like, why it was ordered in the way it was ordered. Like you're saying, maybe you can't do something later. Maybe it's going to be easier if you do this before because you're going to hit something else and ruin it after you finished it already. You know, like there are definitely other reasons that might not get said all the time in tutorial videos, but that are there like there are reasons why people are sure. doing that so sure. um i think i think you can learn a lot by doing that for sure um yeah. even if you're not going to paint an entire army like that even, even just like going i really like that color scheme these are unique to me the way of painting was unique to me try that out ask yourself why like why are they doing the things they're doing you know um, because I think you'll find that, that you'll you'll come away with some some new information that you probably didn't have before. Right. So yeah, actually following the tutorial, you'll gain more from the tutorial. That's a that is a very valid argument. Um, okay, let's let's say there is not actually a video tutorial for this model. Let's say you just have the box for your box art. Okay, maybe the sure, back sure. maybe the back of the box has a little information but let's say you just have the box for your box art okay how how is this beneficial of of trying to copy that casey well i mean you get the general sense of like the colors obviously like oh that orc is green uh this thing over here is like a caucasian skin tone or that's wood and you can kind of extrapolate i mean you obviously like figure out like okay i need to use some kind of green right but you have a reference in front of you, so it's kind of one of those things where you could start with any green you want, and you go, oh, well, you know, I'm going to look at this picture. Well, it's too dark. Okay, cool. Get a little bit brighter. Like, how are you going to do that? You're going to mix in some, uh, some white? You're going to mix in some yellow? You got a brighter green on hand? Like, what are you going to do? What is your solution to solve this problem, to get as close as you can to that box art? And, and because you have that reference, you're going to know if you're right or wrong, you know, or right. if you feel like, oh, this is close enough, you know, like you, you can see that if, you know, it's right in front of you. Like, I love painting with a, a reference. Um, I usually print out a picture of uh, like a couple different models that I like, um, especially if I'm trying to paint something specific. I'll, I'll Google image search a bunch of stuff, print out three or four pictures, and I'll like have them in front of me. So I go, okay, I'm, I want to get it, you know, the skin tone of this uh, troll to look like this. Well, I can see it right in front of me. I know, like, oh, where does that blend stop from here to here? Like, because I like the way that that looks, you know. Um, so you can kind of just, you know, get as close as you want to the actual picture. Like I said, know if you're right or wrong. Right. Massive. Now, I think this is a really good point of, like, actually color matching and seeing if you achieved what was in the picture, that can be hard. I mean, yeah. a lot of times when I'm putting down a wash or I'm highlighting up or something, I don't know what the finished product is going to look like, especially when I'm just throwing down a sure, wash. Sure, sure. And 
a lot of times, you know, like, whoa, that turned out darker than I was expecting, but it's still kind of cool. Let's go with it. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or wow, that, you know, I was highlighting from purple to light blue. And it turned out that the blue is really dominating. I wasn't expecting it to be quite that, that prevalent. But it looks cool. Right. And so <laughs> that is very commonly, you know, what's going through my mind when I'm painting of like, oh, I wasn't quite expecting that, but let's go with it. Like this is, this is going in an interesting direction. Mm -hmm. But if you're, uh, you know, trying to match something on some cover art, you can be like, oh, I did not achieve what I set out to achieve. Yes, this may be inter new and interesting and fun, but I did not get the green that I was going for. Sure. This green is way too dark or light or yellow or minty or, or, or what have you. Yeah, whatever it is, um, yeah. And, I mean... <laughs> I, I guess, you know, got to be careful not to drive yourself too crazy there, you sure. know, like stressing out over it. But as an exercise to improve your skills at color matching, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it I think it starts to give you a sense of, um, like, like you said, color matching, figuring out where in the range of paints that you have, you can kind of find these tones. Um color theory a little bit like like maybe subconsciously because you're you're starting to understand like well okay you know it looks like they used uh you know some yeah whatever blue in this green over here you know and it's got this kind of shadow to it or whatever the case is you know um or you know like the example earlier you said that orange that the pink under undercoat to to yellow creates this like nice orange kind of burnt look in the shadows and i think that you know in order to replicate that you start to see well why why did these things work together and then you're going to do that in the future you're going to say well i know that scrag brown over yellow looks pretty awesome which you wouldn't think it would it's brown over yellow but there you go that's what gives you that nice blendy transition with citadel paints like it's it's a thing that i've seen a thousand times in a thousand tutorials at this point but something that uh you know was discovered early on because it just was there in a picture yeah and i think there's something to be said for using your mental energy in different ways mm -hmm. so i mean like i said uh when i paint i spend a lot of time and effort and <laughs> mental resources thinking about what color i want each bit of that mini to be and yeah, it is nice to say, you know what, I am painting according to this uh, card from the game or the box art or whatever, and just say, all of these decisions are made for me. Everything I can see yeah. in this picture, that's the color it's going to be. And instead of, you know, thinking about uh, complementary colors and, you know, what's going to go with what and what's going to look cool, Instead, I'm thinking about, okay, how am I going to achieve this look? How yeah. am I going to achieve this blend? Mm -hmm. How how am I going to make this as neat as the artist did for this right, uh, right. commission paint job on the box? Yeah. yeah. Um, I had something else for it, too. Uh... Yeah, you just, you know, you're... You are developing different skills because you are completely freeing yourself up from the energy that you'd be spending on picking colors. Um, and once you've freed up that mental energy, you can put it to, to new places and maybe learn something new and interesting. That's true. Um, another, another reason to do it is that, um, you know, especially when you're starting out, like the box art is probably a higher level paint job than what you're probably capable of. Um, so yeah, like going through the motions and trying to get there with matching that box art as much as possible. Like you're probably just going to get better because you're trying something. You're, you're trying to replicate something that is better than your current skill level. You know, so mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be doing things or trying you know, washes or highlights or whatever, you know, edge highlighting a lot of the times is like, oh man, that made such a huge difference. 
that maybe you didn't think about yeah. before. You know, like your space marines go from that's a cool space marine to like, whoa, like I can see all the armor panels on your space marine. You know, and you didn't even realize necessarily why until you started staring at the box art. When I started uh, painting, um, I was painting, I think the first thing I, I got out were Eldar Guardians, you know? And I stared at the box art for hours. Like, I was pretty young, you know? There's not much else to do, but, like, looking at that box art. And one of the major things that I think helped me um, doing that was, besides, like, you know, understanding the colors or buying the paints that I bought for that army or whatever, um, I was able to see the individual areas that were painted on the models. Because sometimes when you prime a model black, you cannot see parts. And then all of a sudden you run into like, there's some weird piece of plastic here and I don't know what this is supposed to be. You know, that's a really uh, good point. Yeah. You look yeah. at the boxer and it's like, Oh, well that's, that's like a grenade. It's not just a bump of plastic. Like there's a grenade on his belt. I need to paint that silver. Right. All of a sudden, yeah. you know, the, the different parts on the model that are there. So when you actually run into them, you're not just going to be confused and shut down all of a sudden. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to move on to the next one, you know? Um, so that helped me a lot when I started because I just knew the models, right? I knew what yeah. each piece was and what it was supposed to look like. Yeah. When I started painting a uh, dark Eldar for, for mm. my first models, <laughs> it was really hard for me to tell uh, whether their spandex was spandex or just yeah, bare skin exactly. in between the armor plates. And if you just start, start painting along and painting along and putting, you know, bare skin in between their armor plates, <laughs> Eventually, you'll you'll end up with their buttocks, and it'll just be hanging out, uh -huh. hanging out elf flesh buttocks. Man, um, that makes me really want to go back and like make a whole army of just assless chap dark Eldar. <laughs> like that that makes perfect sense now. I I completely paint understand bravely, this army. My friend. I completely get it. They're dark. They're into some stuff. Spikes. Yeah, and whips but you look at stuff. the you look at the box. You're like, no, no, <laughs> no. that's spandex, isn't it? That's all. <laughs> yeah space spandex <laughs> yeah so it's so it's yeah their their rear ends are just covered in very tight spandex and yeah yeah it's not entirely Black hanging out latex is what is going on here <laughs> yeah 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 i yeah that's how i interpret you, dark you elder in general the, you change the finish on it and that's what you got for sure <laughs> really shiny maybe, maybe put a few <laughs> reflections on it and a few glints exactly but those are the kinds of things right now all of a sudden you can understand what the material is like is that cloth or is that leather it could be either but how did how did they paint it how does the box look like why is it painted that way right you know right, that's right, and right. again you can look at the, the color like what why did they paint that white and why did they paint that brown you know you look at the surrounding colors and you go oh well there's separation here like it stands yeah. out now like just right. just all these things that the box art can tell you this information yeah. there oh that's a vest i right. get it yeah <laughs> oh, he, it's not just oh he has an undershirt on oh it's a different color isn't it yeah look at that yeah did you just yeah. paint all these characters like just completely naked with like armor over the right. top <laughs> oh it's a shirt it's not uh, a skin <laughs> uh, <laughs> makes that makes a lot more sense just, yeah just look at the box after you've painted everything oh, now you tell me yeah right right <laughs> yeah um but i don't know there was a semi-serious uh, point though about um the chests especially like on a yeah. lot of characters there will be a shirt and an undershirt and a vest and a jacket and sometimes yeah. it's hard to tell which part belongs to which material uh yeah so yeah. the one that catches me off guard is uh if they have a cape or a cloak and there's like a sure. you know an edge that's flipped up and over it's like, yeah. well, uh, which part is the top and which is the bottom? Because sometimes it, it, it's a little bit confusing. So you paint the whole thing and it's like, oh, I'm going to paint this cloak red. And it's like, well, the underside's supposed to be black and you missed a whole corner, you know? Sure. So all of a sudden you just have an unfinished cloak that like has a weird <laughs> separation and it doesn't make any sense. But like you wouldn't necessarily know that without looking at a picture of a finished model. Yeah, I mean, you're making a great point that uh, really studying the box art can just 
help you learn what the model is supposed to be. I mean, that's a really good point because almost every model, there's like some little knickknack, like, mm -hmm. what the heck is that? Right. Is it, like, what is that supposed to be? Are they wearing a ring or is that like a, <laughs> yeah, did they not trim that mold line? Yeah. What's, that's, what is and that's, that? that's what gets me, right? It's like, did I screw this up and I have to start over or is this actually part of the model? Right. Like, or, is, is there supposed to be a, like a pinky finger sticking out at an angle or did I yeah okay. fingers here like yeah a good example <laughs> is i i painted a sail the faithless and the night maw a forge world model for warhammer and they're resin right and so i'm like okay cool you know i bought these super cheap used so you know there's some busted stuff and i put them back together and i go oh no uh this night maw which is like a a, a chaos mutant whatever um, whatever you call him, I can't remember, but he, he had this, he's got this like funky hand, right? And I'm looking at it going, it looks like he's missing a pinky finger. So I mm -hmm. like green stuff, got this out real teeny tiny sculpted this little finger. And I was so proud of myself. Like it looks legit. Like it's hanging off there proper. It's like even angled with the other fingers. And I'm like, yes, I did it. Found the box art like later. There's no finger there. It's just a little bump on the end of his like three finger hand. <laughs> like I thought it was this broken piece of the model. They're like no, like you just ruined it. He looks better with a pinky finger though. You I'm did gonna the say right so. Thing, Casey. I did, yeah. <laughs> but still, yeah. right? It's like I didn't know that. I just assumed, and so yeah. I did all this work for like for nothing. I even put like, and I thought he was supposed to have like this tongue that was sticking out too. Cause it looked like there was a busted off tongue and I did the same thing. And it's like, it looks cool. It looks normal. You can't tell. Uh, cause you know, it's, it's subtle, but like it doesn't need to be there. I just did all this work <laughs> for nothing. Like it does. I don't know. So yeah, yeah, definitely run into that before. So on a base level, look at any painted version of that model to see what stuff <laughs> maybe it's supposed to be. Yeah. The box art especially will tell you what it's supposed to be. Um, yeah. And yeah, just, just, you know, following the box art changes your focus a little bit, gets your mind working in new ways, making new pathways, learning new skills. Yeah. Uh, it, it is definitely a worthwhile exercise once in a while. And, I think so. Uh, yeah. I, I do it sparingly, but yeah, every once in a while, one of the projects I'm working on right now, I am just following the box art, just, yeah. Yeah. As a, as a guide to take a lot of those decisions off my plate and let me concentrate on other things. And, you know, Gordon is here and I think he wants to go watch Dune on HBO Max. So Yeah, I, I think I'm right there with you. Like, Dune on HBO Max seems like the thing to do right now. Uh, I don't know. Seems uh, kind of awesome. Yeah, I know. You're what, like halfway through right now? The movie? Well, 40 minutes in. I was wa I started watching a little Third. bit while you get and set up here and I mean so far it's mostly people walking around in futuristic airports but there's sweet music in the background and like I mean that's in the best way like it so far it is awesome <laughs> right uh, <laughs> it's done very well <laughs> that is a sweet so far, future it airport is awesome yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully they uh they get out of the airport and start riding some giant lizards or you know worms hey no spoilers yeah i literally have no idea i know there are okay. these things i know there's a thing called uh what cumin or some such paprika whatever it's been a long time since i read the book so so yeah i don't think we could spoil it if we wanted to but <laughs> that's that's kind of what i'm saying yeah there's there's no way that we could spoil it <laughs> like, well on that uh, note, it's not a thing on that note thank you again for joining us on another episode of paint bravely if you enjoyed this podcast please help us out by leaving us a review on itunes subscribing to the youtube channel and sharing this message with your hobby friends as always we appreciate each and every one of you for listening and we will talk to you next time Talk to you next time, friends.